Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for how you are ministering to our hearts in every message and everything that goes on here. We thank you because you have prepared everything for us so we can be our best in the service of the Lord, in the kingdom of the Lord. We thank you for these children who are their early age, already able to minister to the hearts of people. We pray that the good thing you have started in them will continue until they see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. We also pray that our own children in our various states, in our various regions, in our various countries, would see the youth choir as a model and they can also have the desire to serve the Lord. Help us, Lord, to give every encouragement possible to the young people in our community so that you can come to the Lord and that you can serve the Lord and challenge our hearts too. We pray that as we look at the pages of Scripture this morning, you speak to every one of us. We pray that our familiarity and intimacy with Scripture will not take away the wonders you have reserved in your word for us. Make the word to be fresh every time. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. As you know, we are studying second epistle of Paul to Timothy in our morning sessions of Bible teaching. And I told you yesterday that second epistle of Timothy or of Paul to Timothy is one of the three that we refer to as pastoral epistles in the New Testament. And by the way, do you know that this was the last epistle that Paul, the apostle, ever wrote? He wrote 14 of the New Testament books. If you count Hebrews as one of the epistles, the books that he wrote. He wrote 14. And as he comes to the end of his life, and he knew he was coming to an end of his life, the Lord used him to preserve these last words, not just for Timothy, but for ministers that will come after him and for the church as a whole. Already we have seen in chapter 1 that Paul the Apostle, although he was very familiar with Timothy, he spoke of the authority of an apostle. Chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Then he tells us the origin of that apostleship by the will of God. He tells us the purpose of that apostleship is for the declaration, the proclamation of the promise of life, life eternal, which we find in Jesus Christ. Then I noted for you that there were four important things that we saw. Uh, manifesting from the life and the ministry of Paul to Timothy. The first one is authority. Although they were intimate, there was still authority. And a preacher needs to maintain the authority of the one that has sent him. And I told you that intimacy does not cancel authority. Intimacy does not preclude authority. But that authority and intimacy will go together in a balanced way. After that, we saw that he had um, affection. He said to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ and Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you find appreciation, thanking God for Timothy, for his life, for his ministry, for his service. Always remembering him, remembering his tears and praying for him night and day and without season. And you'll see also that you have affirmation. 
he affirmed everything good that you could see in him. And he noted that he had known the Holy Scriptures since his uh, infancy or his uh, youth. And that same scripture had been in the mother and the grandmother. But he had a challenge for Timothy. And the challenge was that Timothy will not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, of the word of the Lord, of the Lord himself, or Paul the apostle, the prisoner of the Lord. He was telling Timothy, you must minister, you must walk without shame and in the work of the Lord. And then eventually, he wanted Timothy to maintain sound doctrine. He was saying, whoever loves you, whoever hates you, Whoever fellowships with you, whoever forsakes you, you must make sure you keep on on the sound watch of the Lord. Hold fast, he said in chapter 1, verse 13. The form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he said, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Paul himself as a model, he kept on with sound doctrine and with the word of God until the very end. And he was saying, uh, Timothy, you can do it. I did it by the grace of the Lord. I did it by the enablement of the Lord. I did it by the Spirit of God. I did it relying upon the promise of the Lord. All the things I had going for me, you had them going for you. You too can do it. Stand on the word of God. And in the chapter we're looking at today, he is uh, calling on Timothy and calling upon you and upon me to be strong in the grace of the Lord. Look at chapter 2 verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. His uh, intention was to make Timothy an effective minister. And in this uh, chapter, he gives us the marks of an effective minister. That's what we're looking at today. The marks of an effective minister. Indeed, he wanted to strengthen him. He was weary. He was weak. And uh, there are many leaders today who are weary and weak. And yet, there's the possibility of moving from where you are now and getting to the point of an effective uh, minister. He had told him, start the gift of God in you. He had told him, you need to exercise the power, the love, the sound mind that the Holy Spirit has provided for us. He has told him and is telling us not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And now he starts with an imperative. He starts with a command. And he said, be strong. You know why? Weak leadership produces weak churches. Weak leadership produces weak churches. Only strong leadership can raise up strong leaders and raise up strong churches. The effectiveness of our ministry does not really only depend upon our spiritual resources but on our faithfully using the divinely bestowed resources that God has granted us to have for his glory. And so it says, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not strength in your natural ability. It's not strength in your own particular strength, human strength. It is in the grace of the Lord. The grace of the Lord. And then he spends uh, the rest 25 verses in the chapter telling him how to be strong in the grace of the Lord. Commanding him to be strong, he now tells him how. And I've divided the chapter into four parts. Number one, the symbols of an effective minister. He gives us uh, some figures. He gives us some metaphors, some images that will show us what it means to be strong in the grace of the Lord. Number two, suffering to build an effective ministry. Suffering to build an effective ministry. Number three, separation from evil erring ministers separation from evil 
erring ministers. Number four, sanctification, condition for an effective ministry. Sanctification, condition for an effective ministry. Let's now look at verses two through to verse two, through to seven. And the things thou art said of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. He gives us a symbol there, and it's a symbol of a teacher. Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. He gives us there the symbol of a soldier. And in verse 5, And he and if a man also strive for masteries, yet he see not crowned, except he strive lawfully. That's a picture of an athlete. And in verse 6, The husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits, that's the picture or the image or the symbol of a farmer. And then at the end in verse 7 it says, Consider what I say. Consider what I'm telling you about a teacher, about a soldier, about an athlete, about a farmer. Consider what I say and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. It's telling us that if you can consider the symbols of an effective minister, you will find that if you pattern your ministry, if you pattern the things you do after the characteristics revealed in those pictures, in those images, you are going to be an effective minister. Let's pick them up one by one. The first one is that of a teacher. Look at verse 2 again. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying here? Let's start from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and he taught the truth, the gospel, the word of the Lord, himself being the word personified. Then he handed it over to the apostles. And eventually, Paul himself became an apostle. He was a member of the kingdom of God. That is, he became born again and then became an apostle. He was a chosen vessel. And the Lord taught him and gave him the mysteries of the kingdom. And then he didn't stop with him. He passed it on to Timothy. And he said, Timothy... It didn't stop with me, it must not stop with you. You pass it on to able men who will be able to teach others also. It's a continuing chain. And that is the will of the Lord for the teacher today. You've got it and actually many, many people have passed on before us from the Lord Jesus Christ to the apostles and then to Paul and then to Timothy and then to the faithful and able men, and then to the yet faithful men, and yet to the others. Many centuries have gone. Now it has come to me, it has come to you. Don't let it stop with you. Pass it on as well. He had told him in chapter 1, he had said, guard it. He had said, keep it. He had said, embrace it. He had said, um, exemplify the message of the word. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Demonstrate the power. Demonstrate the light in that message. Keep it for yourself. Don't just keep it. Don't, don't just obey it. Pass it on. And that's what the Lord is telling us. That number one, we're to gird the truth. Honestly contending for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. But not only guarding it, passage on to others have you seen the people running a relay race you'll find that uh, there are four of them and then there is a baton a piece of wood and the first leg he runs and then while he is coming the next person is getting ready warming up almost trotting already and looking in the right direction and then he passes to his son and he goes with it and while he's going with it the other fellow is waiting 
getting ready to get that baton and to run with it. And then he runs his own leg and then he passes it on. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying we're running in a race and uh, we have not reached the end yet. I have finished my own part of the work. I've run the race, I've finished my course, I've done everything, I've kept the faith. I'm now passing it on to you. Timothy, you are going to come to an end when you finish it as well. When you finish, don't put it in your pocket. Don't bury it, pass it on. Those people you are passing it on to, when they finish and they're getting to the end of their lives, they must not hide it, let them pass it on as well. That's the challenge the Lord is giving to every leader. That means we must invest our lives in faithful, able men who will be loyal to the word of God. It means you want to reproduce godly leaders who will reproduce others in a continuing chain. You keep the word of God, you obey the word of God, you love the word of God, you are preaching the word of God, but then you pass it on. And uh, if we do that, that's the only thing we can do that will make our ministry to have a lasting effect. Look at Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, verse 31. And Israel served the Lord. All the days of Joshua. You know why? Moses had passed the baton to Joshua. And Joshua now had taught the people. But now he came to the end of his ministry. And then we are told, And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. Joshua also passed it on to the leaders with him. And then it says, Which had known all the works of the Lord, and that had done uh, that he had done for Israel. Unfortunately, it stopped somewhere. It stopped somewhere. The Levites did not continue to teach the word of God. And the Levites did not continue to pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. And if you look at the denominations in the world, that's what has happened to many, many denominations. It got started, and then the original, the first leaders passed on the baton, and then it came to a time when the people were not passing it on anymore. And now you have a lot of things in those denominations that started well because the leaders that outlived, the original foundational leaders, they didn't continue to pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. But the Lord is telling us, you've got the truth, you hold on to the truth, pass it on. That is what is going to help us as uh, we continue in the work of the Lord. And uh, look at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, looking at it from verse 14. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. A lot of things actually you have in that verse. He uh, ordained them. He selected them. He chose them. He put them in place. And then that they might be with him, to listen to him, to be taught by him, to be instructed in the way of righteousness, to have the fullness of the gospel, that they might be with him, to see his life, to see his ministry, to see everything that he was doing, and then that he might send them forth to preach. I want to give you seven points there. In the method of Jesus Christ, as selecting the people, getting the people together, giving everything to them, and then sending them to pass it on. Number one is consecration. Jesus Christ said, I sanctify myself that you might be sanctified. I separated myself, I dedicated myself, I put myself apart for the work the Lord has called me to, and I did it to fulfill it so that I can get it to you. He himself was fully consecrated. If you are a leader wanting to teach other people, you are a leader wanting to develop other people, you get the truth, you believe the truth, you live by the truth, you want to pass it on to other people the first thing in your life is consecration number two selection he selected the people 
obviously he being the son of God he knew the qualities required in the people that needed to be in the important place he was approaching them but apart from that you look at verse 13 he goes up into a mountain and he calleth unto him whom he would and they came unto him when he went to the mountain top Luke tells us he went to pray in fact he prayed all night before he made the selection you're a leader it is not that well I'm a good preacher that's not enough I'm a good evangelist that's not enough pass it on train other people select other people I thank the Lord when I preach people get converted that's not enough I thank the Lord when I teach people understand that's not enough you consecrate yourself number one then there is selection number three instruction you have selected the people now you have workers to take care of the women of the women you have workers to take care of the youth you have workers taking care of the campus people you have workers dealing with the choir you have workers that are dealing with various sections you have selected them now there is instruction you are instructing them you are teaching them and you are spending you are pouring your life into them everything you know every jot every tittle every dot of an i every cross of a t every little thing every big thing all the things you know you have been taught in the word of god through the spirit of god you will pass on to other people you instruct them number four demonstration that's what jesus did jesus demonstrated everything before his disciples and how to heal the sick he didn't lecture them too much they saw it how to cast out devils he didn't lecture them too much they saw it and how to preach a line upon line precept upon precept is they saw it and how to interpret the old testament bring the old and put uh, the grace and the love of the new covenant in that old uh, testament passage they saw it it was a demonstration that's why if you are training other people you will demonstrate it everything there is to be done I find that there are some leaders and uh, they say well I don't know music and therefore whatever the music department does well that's good enough for them you must show that you are willing to learn and you get involved in every area of the ministry so that you can demonstrate you can say this how it is done this how it should be done this how it should be done this how that should be done then number five delegation he had um, consecrated himself he had selected them he had instructed them he had demonstrated before them and they had seen how those things should be done and now he, he called them two by two and he delegated he sent them out he said you go and do it you know what happened when they came back they reported to him everything they had done we we'll call that number six supervision he delegated he told them what to do and then he supervised them so that he'll be able to say well that's all right there that's not all right there you need improvement there you couldn't do that because of your lack of faith here supervision and then number seven reproduction before he left he said do you know the purpose of everything i've been passing on to you it is so that you can do exactly the same thing I have done. He said that in at different times. He said, I'm your Lord and Master. You've seen what I've done to you so that you can do the same as well. And in the area of ministry, he said, He that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do. And greater work than this shall he do because I go to the Father. Reproduction. Therefore, understand what Paul was telling Timothy. You have heard it in the midst of other people like you are hearing it now at the congress it should not stop here it's not just that i love the word i appreciate the word i receive the word pass it on to other people consecration instruction uh, selection instruction demonstration delegation supervision and reproduction now like that we have seen the first uh, image or the first symbol the strategy of reproducing teachers preachers and leaders which will give us a kind of continuing chain of developing other people we now pass on to the next thing in uh, second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 3 
Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that ye may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. The next thing he's talking about is the symbol or the imagery of a soldier. This is talking about spiritual strength so that we can have an effective uh, ministry. He was saying, don't just be a soldier. Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Functionary, dutiful, loyal, noble, in fact, heroic. He was uh, telling Timothy, he said, Timothy, it's not enough to even think about the picture of a teacher that is reproducing other leaders. Think of the picture of a dutiful, loyal, noble, heroic soldier. And now you make up your mind that all those characteristics, all those qualities of life you see in the soldier, you yourself, you are going to have everything. And as a good soldier, effective minister, you will endure hardness. You'll have your own share of hardship, of suffering, of trial, of rough treatment by the world. Get ready, take it. And then he said, you must be well disciplined. That's the essence of using the imagery of a soldier. You must not be entangled with the affairs of this life. Your body, your health, your skills, all that you are and all that you have belong to the ministry where you are serving. Just as everything a soldier is, everything a soldier has belongs to the military where he is serving. And you know, whenever a soldier was ordered or commanded into dangerous duty, he's expected to put his very life on the line without question and without hesitation. And Paul the Apostle was saying, Timothy, something has to be taken away from you. That spirit of timidity, of fear, cringing, shrinking, that will be withdrawing from a difficult task. Timothy, you cannot be like that if you're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Whenever duty calls, wherever duty calls, as a good soldier, get ready and put your neck to the yoke. That's what he was telling him. A good soldier is the one that will refuse to allow earthly matters to interfere with the fulfillment of his duty. And that's uh, what the Lord is telling us in this uh, new year as uh, we are in this Congress preparing and uh, looking at what we're going to do in the year and for the rest of our lives that you will refuse to allow earthly matters to interfere with the fulfillment of your duty to the Lord. Our only desire will be to please the commander-in-chief. And thank God, that's our desire. That's our interest. And we're going to do it in Jesus' name. It means we'll not be men pleasers. We're looking at him and looking at him alone. And he is the one we want to please. And of course, you know, if you're going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you'll put on the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. Now we go to the um, third figure, that is the third uh, symbol. That's that of an athlete. It tells us in verse 5, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Is uh, telling us here uh, of an athlete when it says strive for masteries. If you read other versions of the English Bible, you'll see it saying compete as an athlete. Compete as an athlete. What are the things that characterize the life of an athlete? You know that there is contending, there is contesting, there is struggling. You cannot have an athlete that will not contest and contend, that will not struggle. That means then the attitude of folding my hands and saying, well, the Lord will do whatever he wants to do, whether I am zealous or not, whether I am up and doing or not, 
whether I do anything or not, God is so mighty and so powerful that he's able to save the world without a much effort for me. No, you have to be like an athlete. There is contending, there is contesting, and there is struggling. In fact, the very idea of an athlete means competing with great determination to win. That's the thing that characterizes an athlete. You are contending and you are competing with great determination to win. You know, there are people that tell us that, uh, well, uh, being fruitful does not matter. Leave that in the hands of God. All that matters is being faithful. That's not scriptural. I have ordained you. I have put you in place. I have chosen you, you have not chosen me, that you may go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit will remain. It's not just to be faithful in isolation. The faithfulness is connected with fruitfulness. The athlete has the mind to win, and he has determination to win. In fact, the very essence of athletics is effort. Effort. Are you making effort? Are you doing anything? Are you improving yourself? Are you getting better today than you were yesterday? Number two, determination. Is there determination within you? Or are you just drifting? Just preaching? Just praying? Just counseling? Just doing something? Is there a determination? Number three, persistence. That's what we find with the athletes they persist in what they are doing number four is sacrifice they sacrifice they deny themselves of whatever will hinder them from gaining the victory number five training they train themselves you know that uh, if you are reading the papers and if you know what goes on in athletics they have a coach for them and the coach will drill them and will make them go through a lot of things and they deny themselves of a lot of things just so that they will be able to win and they maintain all that kind of effort determination persistence sacrifice training self-denial they maintain that consistently for many many years as long as they're still in athletics so that they can win the effective minister therefore like a serious athlete must uh, control must have control over his affections over his emotions and over his priorities over his objectives that's what Paul was telling it. Timothy he said, you'll be like an athlete. You will have control over your affections, over your emotions, over your priorities, over your objectives. If the athlete is going to win, he has to keep the rules of the event. I don't have time to tell you that in those olden days uh, with the uh, Roman uh, people, those people that were going to uh, be selected to participate in uh, athletics, they had some rules they had to follow. Number one, the rule of birth. They will want to find out where they were born. And they will go into details finding out whether they meet up to that rule of birth uh, before they are selected. And that links up with the rule of their selection. And then, number two, the rule of training. In fact, because they were idol worshippers at that time, uh, they will go before Zeus. That's one of their gods. And then they will swear before Zeus that they have practiced continu continuously for about 10 months. If they discovered that they had not practiced like that and they have sworn falsely before that false deity, what they will do is to disqualify them. There were the rules for training and then the rule of competition itself. You know what Paul was telling Timothy? He was saying, Timothy, you know that those athletes, if they are going to participate in athletics, they need to go through the rules of selection and the rules of training and the rules of competition. And now the effective minister must also pass through the rules of selection. You know it in the Bible. There are qualifications of people that are going to serve the Lord. Are we keeping those rules today? Or do we just bring somebody in 
because he has this quality that quality that quality do we bring somebody in just because we want to keep him in our church involve him in our church because if we keep him involved involvement brings commitment he will not be able to run to another church that's how we destroy the church we're no more looking at the rules of selection and then the rules of training and uh, here at the headquarters if uh, we have uh, our sunday service and i discovered that uh, somebody did not come for a preparatory for Sunday scripture and it was to lead Sunday scripture who oh, will just say we're sorry we know that he has the ability but he didn't come for the preparatory therefore he will not teach and uh, last sunday i was at the service and at a second service so what to have um, uh, interpretation into another language and I found a brother there. I said, are you the one interpreting? He said, uh, no. I said, where is the interpreter? He had not come. By the time we were singing the congressional song, or just before we sang, he had come. He didn't interpret for that day. You see, there are rules we need to keep. And except we keep those rules, we will not be able actually to be effective ministers in the kingdom of the Lord. We need to be that strict so we can maintain the standard. And then the rule of competition. When somebody is uh, doing something, you look at what he's doing. Is that according to the word of God? Is that the laid down principle? Does it follow everything we have been learning except it follows everything we're learning? Is not preparing himself as a competent, effective minister of the gospel to win the crown. We must be disciplined, having control over our body, over our tongue, over our mind, over our desires, over our relationships. Now he comes to number four. That's in Second Timothy chapter two, reading from verse six. The husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. The husband man that laboreth. That means the farmer, the one that is cultivating the ground, is saying, uh, Timothy, uh, you know the farmer. And you know the thing that he has to go through before he can bring the crops to feed the nation. Labor. That's uh, what he needs to go through. An industrious farmer. Then there will be hard work. There will be intense toil. Then sweat and a strain that will characterize a faithful, a fruitful farmer. All that must characterize an effective minister. The industrious farmer starts work early and finishes late each day. The effective industrious farmer starts work early and finishes late each day. Now, if you, you are here now, if uh, the Lord were to give us a form to fill, you are a pastor. You are a Bible study leader. You are perhaps a women leader. If uh, the Lord were to put uh, the farmer on one side and you on the other side, and uh, the Lord were to say, uh, look at the way the farmer does the work. He rises up early and he, gets the, he begins the work. He comes back late so that he can finish the job appointed for that day. How do you do yours in the kingdom of God? You'll find that we fall short a lot. Do you measure up to being a good soldier? Do you measure up to being a teacher, guarding the truth and passing on the truth? Do you measure up to being a determined athlete? Who is determined to win? Do you measure up to that of the farmer? Who endures cold and eat, rain and drought? And who will plow the soil, whether it is hard or soft? Who will fight the pests and the insects and the foxes, whether little or big? Who will not wait for his own convenience because he knows the rainy season will not wait for him? The dry season will not wait for him. Can we say that we're doing everything according as these symbols have shown us? See verse 7. Consider what I say. It says, Timothy... And then, by extension, he's saying, brother or sister, consider what I say. What I'm saying about the teacher. Are you teaching? Are you developing and training and involving people? 
Are you reproducing yourself in other people? He said, consider what I say about a soldier. Are you enduring hardness? Are you disciplined? Are you determined to always please the commander-in-chief? Are you refusing earthly entanglements? Are you dutiful? Are you loyal? Are you noble? Are you heroic in your service to the Lord? He said, consider what I say, what I'm saying about the athlete. He said, are you making effort? Are you training yourself? Are you practicing? Are you determined to win? Are you persistent? Are you manifesting sacrifice and self-denial? Are you consistent about it? Do you have control over your emotions, over your affections, over your priorities, over your objectives? Do you have control over your body, over your tongue, over your mind, over your desires, over your relationships? He said, Timothy, consider what I say, what I'm saying about the farmer. Do you labor? Do you work hard? Do you manifest intense toil to be able to produce the fruit? And are you willing to continue till harvest time? Verse 7, consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. I pray God will give us understanding. And I pray that we'll not just hear these things, we'll check up these things, match them with our lives, so that by the grace of God, these symbols will have meaning in our lives. We'll go to point number two. In point number two, we are suffering to build an effective ministry. We're looking at it from verse eight. It says, remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bounds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a, it is a faithful sin. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. You see, in this place, he's talking about suffering. And uh, Paul the Apostle is mentioning something which is very, very significant. He's telling us that there must be willingness to endure suffering. That is part of our readiness to be used by God in the salvation of sinners. It is part of our readiness to be used in, by God in the salvation of sinners. If you want everything to be very convenient, if you want everything to be very easy, if you do not want anything to inconvenience you, you are not going to mean much to the kingdom of God in expanding, extending the kingdom of God. It tells us, he said, remember, verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now is the gospel of the Lord, but he became so identified with that gospel, he said, you cannot separate that gospel from me. It's like my hand belongs to me. And you cannot uh, do away with my hand uh, without you are getting at me. He said, my head belongs to me. And you cannot do away with my head without getting at me. He said, as the members of my body belongs to me, I've made up my mind that the gospel belongs to me as well. And it's so much part of me, you cannot take anything away from it without getting at me. That's why he said, according to my gospel. You see, when the word of God becomes so important, it becomes so much part of you. Anybody taking anything away from it, it's like they are cutting your fingers. And you say, you are getting at me. You are getting at me. If you continue that, it's going to be a lot painful. And we're going to separate because if I see you wanting to cut off members of my body, I eventually, I will know you are not a friend. The same thing, somebody is wanting to tamper with the gospel. Somebody wants to take something away from the gospel. You say you are getting at the real core of the matter. I can part with money. I can part with property. I can part with any other thing. 
the gospel I cannot part with. It is part of me. You are getting at me when you touch that gospel. That was the attitude of Paul the Apostle. And that was to be the attitude of Timothy. And that is to be your attitude. And it is to be my attitude. He said something about Jesus Christ, which I like to summarize in this way. He said, Timothy, have you noticed Jesus Christ? Do you remember Jesus Christ? Resurrection after death. Death first. Resurrection after death. He said, have you remembered Jesus Christ? Exaltation after humiliation. Do you remember him? The crown after the cross. Do you remember him? The salvation of others after suffering. He is uh, putting Jesus Christ up as our model. As our example. And he's saying, you will go through the death process first. Before there will be a resurrection. And you will go through humiliation first. Before there will be an exaltation. And you will have to endure the cross. And bear the cross and carry the cross. Before you will wear the crown. And then you will suffer before success. And so he says, remember Jesus Christ. And now he goes on to the real suffering in verse 9. Wherefore, I suffer trouble. As you look at this epistle, this epistle underlines, underscores, puts emphasis on suffering. Let me just uh, run through with you to a few verses. In chapter 1 and verse 8. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Affliction, suffering for the gospel of the gospel. Chapter 1 verse 12. For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Do you see suffering in connection with the ministry? Chapter 2 in verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Affliction, suffering, hardness. And then in chapter 2 verse 9, it says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. And then in chapter chapter 2 verse 10 therefore i endure all things for the elect's sake that they also may obtain salvation which is in christ jesus with eternal glory chapter 3 verse 12 yea and all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution he said it's not peculiar to me everyone that will live godly it's not peculiar to the first century of the Christian faith of the early church, everyone that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Chapter 4 and verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You will see that this epistle is telling us that the ministry, the work of the Lord, goes along with suffering. There's a beautiful verse in, in uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, please open your Bible. In verse 29, for unto you it is given. Listen to this. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's given to you. It's part of the deal. It's part of the thing you get when you come into the kingdom. We're suffering to build an effective ministry. Therefore, endure. Paul was willing to suffer. He was willing to suffer so that he could become the channel, the instrument of salvation to a lot of people. Let's come back to um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 9, it says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Have you uh, heard of Pilgrim's Progress before? Okay, who wrote that? John Boyan. Do you know that John Boyan was in jail when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress? He will not compromise. He was a non-conformist. 
And because of that, they imprisoned him. And even though they imprisoned him, not only that, uh, they imprisoned the, the prison cell where he was, they had a wall around. And that wall was very, very high. He would stay in his cell in the room in the morning. And then the congregation, they will gather outside, outside the wall. The congregation will be there. They will not see him. He was in the cell. He will not see them. He will open the Bible on top of his voice. He'll be preaching. Then they'll be hearing over the wall. When he finishes the preaching, the people pray. They cry to the Lord. They get saved. They, get, they go back home. The following day, they come back behind the wall again. He was bound, but the word of God was not bound. If you have read about Spurgeon before, now Spurgeon had a useful ministry, an evangelical, but uh, he became sick and indisposed. Because of that, he could not carry on the normal ministry of a pastor. And then he sat down and he wrote Treasury of David. And there is nothing like it. If you've not got it, you'll get it. Three volumes. Uh, some maybe they have combined to one volume, but three volumes of the standard edition of a treasury of David that comments on Psalm 1 till Psalm 150. And it brings a lot of other writers. After he has uh, put his own commentary, he was sick. And because he was sick and they bound there in sickness in the house, of course he didn't understand on healing uh, by faith, but he was still useful to the Lord. Those of us who are there today, if we have a little problem, then we cannot serve the Lord anymore. Do you remember John Wesley? That's the champion of the holiness message, sanctification. Unfortunately, he had a wife. If you had a wife that is one percent as bad as the wife of John Wesley, you will not lead house fellowship. You say, look at my trouble. Look at all the sin I'm going through. It is this woman. I want to serve God. I am consecrated. I want to do everything for the Lord. But it is this woman. If you add a woman as bad as 1% of uh, the characteristics of the wife of uh, John Wesley, you will say, well, uh, if I don't keep sanctification, if I cannot preach it, it's not my fault. It's this woman. It's unfortunate I made a mistake in my marriage. That John Wesley read about his life and read about his marriage. It was terrible. But in the midst of that fire in that house, he wrote commentary on the whole Bible. He wrote eight volumes of letters uh, to people. He wrote uh, eight volumes or ten volumes of uh, journals. Uh, that is, is a, is a diary. And he wrote sermons. Wrote sermons. And he preached. He went everywhere without vehicle, without anything. The trouble was there. Every time he came back home, he knew it was fire. But that man, although he was bound in that area, the word of God is, was not bound. I believe today we can do something. And we're going to do something in Jesus' name. Well, what's talking about Paul the Apostle? I told you yesterday that Paul the Apostle, he was imprisoned in Jerusalem. He was imprisoned in Caesarea. He was in, imprisoned in Philippi. He was imprisoned in Rome. He was imprisoned. He will come out. He will get in again. He will come out. He will get in again. Imprisoned every time. The people that were not imprisoned in the New Testament, they didn't write any epistle. They didn't write anything. They didn't go through any missionary journey. They didn't preach to anybody. But Paul, the apostle that suffered more than everybody else, he wrote more than everybody else. He preached more than everybody else. He traveled more than everybody else. He suffered more than everybody else. He saved more people more than everybody else. Why can't we do it? We can do it. I said we can do it. And so he said, although I am bound, but the word of God is not bound. He said, therefore, I endure all things. That's my calling. Whatever comes, I'm enduring it. For the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a faithful thing, for if we be dead with him, dead with him, dead with him, then we shall live with him. If we suffer with him, then we are also going to reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. I pray you will not deny him. If we believe not, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now we go to point number three. Point number three, that is separation from evil 
erring ministers. From 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about what to no profit, but uh, to the subversion of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Amanius and uh, Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, and saying that the resurrection is past already, overthrowing the faith of some. You see, Paul the Apostle, he was warning Timothy. He said, not everybody believes sound doctrine. Not everybody believes the full gospel. Not everybody accepts everything the Lord has revealed unto his people. Therefore, he said, you'll be very, very careful. In verse 16, he said, shun profane vain babblings. Then he gave the reason. He said, because their word." Even conversation with them, even reading their literature, or even listening to their messages will corrupt you and will defile you. In fact, it will overturn your faith. And then he mentions the names of two people. He said, uh, Hermanius and uh, Philetus. Then he mentioned their false doctrine. Uh, you know, Paul the Apostle, he had nothing to hide. And whenever he spoke, he spoke everything there was to say. You see, there are people today, they are so educated, they will say, well, there is evil in the world. We knew that without your saying that. Pinpoint it. Let's know what it is. So we'll be able to run away from it if we see it. There are some people that will want their congregation, or they say, there's false doctrine everywhere. We knew that. Tell us the false doctrine that is in your city so that your people will not be deceived and then there's some people that will say well you people you know jesus said there are false prophets therefore we need to be very careful but you see i'm here on the pulpit i don't want to mention any name i don't want to do anything i don't want to be uh, uncharitable i just want you to be very very careful how are they going to be very very careful the Jehovah's Witnesses are coming to them. You cannot tell them that there is no gospel in their message. The Mormons are coming to them. You cannot tell them there is no gospel in their message. Just say, you know, the people are there. Uh, watch out very carefully. Uh, watch out where you go. Watch out what you read. Because not everybody outside there is uh, praying the gospel. Tell them what it is the way it is. You see, Paul the Apostle, he mentioned the names. When you do that, of course, you are not going to be popular. If you are looking for being popular, you will never do what the Lord wants you to do. And uh, thank God, there are times, if I remember them, if I don't remember, of course, I will not say what I don't know. But if I remember, I will tell the congregation that Jehovah's Witnesses are there. They are waiting for you behind the wall. Don't get their literature. Don't get their cassette. Don't get their material. Although the pictures are colorful, they are poisonous. Throw them away. If you've got them in the house, when you get back now, uh, have a bonfire and set them on fire. Maybe you will not say that. I think you will say it. I said you will say it. If there is false doctrine somewhere among the people of God, this is false doctrine so that they will be able to sit up and know what is right from what is wrong. In fact, he even mentioned their names personally. And then he also mentioned the doctrine that they were perpetrating. He said concerning the truth, they have erred. And then he said, they were saying, the resurrection is past already, overthrowing the faith of some. That means we need to be bold for the truth, so that you say exactly what the Lord wants us to say. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the epitome that is the very high standard on love, he warned of false prophets. And he is our example. And we are following after his footsteps. In Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 15. Beware of false prophets 
which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He warned them in chapter 16 and verse 12. Chapter 16, reading from verse 12. Then they understood how he had bid them not to beware of the living of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those were powerful religious sects of that day. But Jesus Christ warned the people. And the, and the apostles also, they did the same thing. Of course, you know that uh, Paul, the apostle, did it over and over and over again. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, and also of yourselves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Uh, you know something that disturbs me in deeper life today? Uh, when we have programs that is outside, outside the headquarters here, and I come to your places, it disturbs me a lot when the program is going on, and one of your preachers, maybe a coordinator, maybe a region overseer, maybe another person, is preaching. And the state overseer is not there. He trusts everybody so much that they will not say anything wrong. They're going to say everything correctly. He might be in his house, or he might uh, be supervising kitchen, or he might uh, be with the electronics people, and the message is going on. I don't do that except uh, something really happens that maybe my physical strength will not carry me anymore i like to stay there and maybe those of you are here you don't know all that we've been doing in lagos here from the very first week of uh, december we had the first retreat and i had to preach in the morning and uh, many of them had to preach in the evening they were the second retreat said the second weekend then the third retreat then the fourth retreat after that we had uh, our french uh, congress that finished uh, last week and then i went for sunday service and then we started here on monday and when other people are preaching i sit down there why i want to hear what they're saying i want to see whether it's going to be according to the word of god or it's going to deviate a little i know the people that are preaching in fact i gave them those messages i appreciate them i love them i even know the level of spirituality and i respect them very very much but even though i respect them and i love them and i appreciate them and i know they are going to say the right thing but should in case i will sit down there and then I will listen to what is being said. And the thing touches my heart. I say, praise the Lord. These people have been developed. If uh, Jesus studies and somebody has to live before Jesus comes, I think there are people that will take the baton. And they will be able to run with it. But you know, there are people that will not sit down there. They will just allow people to preach and preach and preach. They do not listen to what their people are saying. But Paul the Apostle said, he said, I know. After my departure, there will be grievous wolves that will come in, even from among you, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Then he said in verse 31, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years i cease not to warn every one night and day with tears and so you see the carefulness of paul the apostle and you see the challenges given you and given to me that must watch against paul's doctrine we must watch against anything that is not according to the totality of the full gospel that the lord has given unto us now, we go back to 2 Timothy and we're looking at uh, chapter 2 and in verse 15. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's what study means, endeavor. Make your, do your best, your maximum. Put the greatest effort into it so that you'll be a person approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth that means rightly preaching analyzing interpreting applying the word of God therefore you will make sure that you yourself as a leader you are studying the word of God 
you are keeping to the word of God. You make the word of God the number one thing in your life. That's what the apostle said in Acts chapter 6, reading from verse 3. Acts chapter 6, reading from verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among uh, yourselves, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but, verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. I pray that God will help all of us as leaders to go back to this seriousness of keeping to the word of God in Jesus' name. Now we go to point uh, no, number four. In point number four, now we have sanctification, uh, the condition for an effective uh, ministry. We're looking at verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are is. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now you see what he's telling us here. He's telling us that sanctification is very important. Holiness is very important. Being purged, circumcised in your heart, a definite work of grace that happens and it affects your life, affects your character, affects your commitment, affects everything within you, affects everything around you. He said that is so important for you to be an effective minister and then he tells us he looks at a great house the great house is talking about church he, you know the church the large church with everybody inside there and then he talks about the vessels and he says there are vessels of gold and vessels of silver then he says there are vessels of wood and vessels of earth that is of clay like the clay pot and then he tells us some to dishonor and then the others to dishonor. He's looking at a household. And he's looking at the various uh, containers that were used in the household. You know, there are some of the run-of-the-mill utensils that you have in the house. If you see it, you know, anyhow. And uh, you don't uh, serve visitors with that. When the visitors come, you have some vessels reserved for them. That's what he's talking about. The kind of vessel that will serve the best of people in the best of time with the best of nourishment. That's what he's talking about. But then he says that there are some vessels to dishonor. Actually, what the apostle means here is the kind of vessels to use to put the human waste in. You know, in those days, uh, they didn't have the water closet. That is, the toilet was the new modern system. So what they will have is, they will have some containers with them at night. If their children wanted to urinate, if their children wanted to pass human waste, instead of going outside to where the toilet was in those days, they will say that vessel is there, that's the vessel of wood and the vessel of clay, and put the waste there and cover it up. And then in the morning, they'll carry that out and they go and throw it away. I think they still do that in the village, don't they? Okay, don't raise up your hand. Uh, but they still do that in villages today. But uh, Paul the Apostle was saying, there are vessels of gold, reserved to serve the best of people with the best of nourishment of, or meals. But then there are also vessels to dishonor. Then he said, if a man, he now wants to be a vessel unto honor, a vessel that will serve the kingdom of God, serve the people of God, serve the church of God. If a person will be a vessel unto honor, what are the things that he must have? There are seven things I want to quickly point to you before we conclude. Number one, he must be sanctified. That's in verse 21. It tells us, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. 
That's the number one thing. Sanctified and meat for the master's use prepared for every good work. When we talk of sanctification, I'm sure you know already, we're talking of the pure heart. The heart that is cleansed and purged. We're talking of holiness. We're talking of godliness. We're talking of an irreproachable life which is a basic and indispensable qualification to be a vessel unto honor. This sanctification must not be a doctrine we are preaching. There are people who preach. It must not be a past experience. There are people that can say, 19 such and such, I was born again. 19 such and such, I was sanctified. 19 such and such, I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. It must not just be a past experience. It must be a present reality in our heart and in our life the sanctified in that verse 21 is coming from the greek word that carries the meaning of being made holy set apart from sin made free from sin cleansed from moral corruption and pollution free from the power of cancelled sin that means your sins have been forgiven that's salvation but then the power of cancel sin is also broken in your life so that that sin or the sin principle does not have any authority over your life anymore sanctification and instantaneous circumcision of the heart is obtained and retained by number one separation from all sin and appearances of evil separation from all sin and appearance of evil number two having strong desire thirst and hunger for the purity of heart and life and after you have been sanctified it is necessary you will maintain that hunger you will maintain that thirst it uh, it still beats my imagination if uh, we're preaching on sanctification and somebody feels oh, i'm sanctified already uh, that thing they are talking is for those who have not been sanctified that beats my imagination because by the grace of god it's not like that with me i want to listen i want to hear what uh, you know the people are saying i told you that we just finished our french congress and in our french congress we had basically the same messages that we're hearing here and in the French Congress, I had the message that somebody else gave on the death of self and the Lordship of Christ. And when we were to come here this morning, oh, I didn't say I had that in the French Congress. And they are likely to say the same thing. Not only that, the brother preaching this morning had given me his outline for me to go through and see if there is anything I wanted to say. And I'd gone through the outline and I knew what was on paper. I didn't say, well, I already know it. I sat down there and uh, were you touched this morning? I said, were you touched this morning? It touched me so much as if I never had a message like that myself before. Even though I'm a pastor, even though I could have preached that message myself, it touched me as if I could not open my mouth to know even where to start to begin to pray. Now you see, even though you are a pastor, even though you are a teacher, when other people are preaching and they are talking on the death of self, the lordship of Christ, sanctification experience, how we can be nearer to the Lord, become more intimate to the Lord, you will sit down and soak in the word of God, drink in the word of God, maintain the thirst and maintain the hunger. If we do that, that thing will keep us until the final day you will not become so intimate and so familiar with the word of god that you say well i don't think i need that anymore we need the word of god i said we need the word of god so then number one uh, to be a, an effective uh, minister you will be sanctified number two flee youthful lust flee youthful lust your flesh may demand something that's temptation that you know is not the will of god run away from it if your right eye causes you to offend, cut it off. Pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to offend, cut it off. That means separate from anything you know by experience or from experience that it normally leads you into uh, evil. Or you know that that's a weak point in your life. If you tarry long, if you stay long by that sin, it's going to begin to work out something in your life that will lead you into backsliding eventually. Before it does that, run away from it flee from youthful loss number three follow pursue righteousness and faith 
and love and peace with other believers, people of like precious faith. Number four, calling upon the Lord, praying continually out of a pure heart. That you'll find in verse 22. And then number five, avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Avoid foolish or unlearned questions. Number six, be gentle, be patient, be meek. Verses 24 and 25. And then number seven, have the ability and the skill to teach convincingly and effectively. This chapter is uh, telling us how to be strong in the Lord, how to be effective in the Lord. And it's telling us that we must be a teacher, guarding the word of God, passing it on. We must be good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, enduring and determining to be able to get uh, to the final uh, place, and then we'll be able to win the reward on the final day. It means that you're willing to endure, you're willing to serve, no matter how difficult the place may be, you say, Lord, I am ready. I will stay at my post. Even if need, if need be, I will die at my post. Be like an athlete. Make the effort. Determine to win. Sacrifice. Deny yourself. Bear the cross. And whatever the rules of selection, the rules of competition, or the rules of training may be, give yourself to it. Addict yourself to the service of the Lord. And be like the farmer that will wake up early in the morning and then come back late at night that will plant at the right season that knows the season will not wait for him. And he says, eh, the nation to feed depends upon me. To feed the church, it depends upon me by the grace of God. Therefore, I'm going to do everything possible, even to give the last drop of blood in my body, so that the people that need to be saved, they will be saved. The people that need to be sanctified, developed, baptized in the Holy Ghost, helped, counseled, and uh, matured, they will have everything they ought to have. I will be everything God wants me to be. I will not yield into timidity or fear or weakness. I'm going to stand at my post until Jesus comes. You'll find me there. Is that uh, your testimony? Is that your consecration? Is that what you are willing to tell the Lord? Then you rise up and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Lord Jesus, begin with me. Start with me. Who will go for you, Lord? Who will go for you, Lord? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me, Lord. Send me. Are you willing to endure affliction? Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to be like a real teacher? Everything you have got, you want to pass it on. Pass it on. Pass it on. Don't let the gospel die at your doorstep. Pass it on. Don't let the gospel terminate there at your doorstep. Pass it on. And be a good soldier. And be an athlete. Be like an athlete. And be like a real farmer that is willing to do everything it takes so that by the grace of God, you will produce fruit. And keep on working until the time of the harvest. Keep on working until the time of the harvest. Be willing to suffer. Be willing to suffer. Don't look for ease or worldly pleasure. Don't look for convenience. If you are transferred to a place that's a little bit hard and difficult, do it immediately. Don't be praying for three months and six months and one year before you can go to a difficult place. Don't look for ease. Don't look for convenience. Be willing to suffer for the salvation of other people. And separate yourself from false prophets. I hope there is no literature of Jehovah's Witnesses in your room. On your shelf. I hope you are not keeping the books of Mormons in your room, on your shelf, or Christian science, all the cults and the sects. Keep to the word of God, the pure gospel that brings full salvation. Keep to the word of God.
I hope you are not borrowing the, you are not getting cassettes of the prosperity preachers. The people that are commercializing religion. I hope you are not learning their methods. Separate yourself from evil erring ministers. Let sanctification be the center of your life. Of your relationship. Of your activities. 